Good afternoon and a warm welcome to all of you. I'm Joy Connolly. I'm honored to serve as president of the American Council of Learned Societies. Today, I'm delighted to introduce to you the 2021 Charles Homer Haskins Prize lecturer, Dr. Janetta Betch Cole. Dr. Cole graces us with her, her presence on the 39th occasion of the Haskins Prize lecture, which is named in honor of the first director of ACLS. Once again this year, we're holding the Haskins Prize lecture, not in person at our ACLS annual meeting as we typically do, but in a separate event online. By contrast to last year, we now see many reasons for optimism. We dearly hope we're emerging from this pandemic. But in recognition of the grievous losses of the past year and the continuing suffering in this country and around the world, let us take a moment of silence. Recognition, truth, justice, new vision. We are much in need of all these things these days. So it's very much in the spirit of eager welcome that we await the words of this 2021 Haskins Prize lecturer. Through her extraordinarily distinguished career, Dr. Janetta Cole has touched the lives of countless people, empowering them to recognize the world as it is, to speak the truth, to fight for justice, to make the world afresh. I'll remind you that the executive committee of our delegates selects the lecturer each year for the Haskins Prize, and we preserve the lectures on our website. Especially in difficult times like these, they make for very inspiring reading. For the Haskins Lecture offers us an unusual opportunity to learn by example, by hearing scholars think aloud about themselves. Lecturers are asked, and I quote from the original charge, to reflect on a lifetime of work as a scholar on the motives, the chance determinations, the satisfactions and the dissatisfactions of a life of learning, and to explore through one's own life, the larger institutional life of scholarship. We do not wish the speaker to present the products of one's own scholarly research, but rather to share with other scholars the personal process of a particular lifetime of learning. Today, we are honored to hear Dr. Cole, a celebrated anthropologist, teacher, scholar of Africa and its diaspora, leader and innovator in higher education and the arts, respected author and speaker, valued institutional advisor on race, gender, and social justice, and exemplary mentor to many women and men. Dr. Cole, or Sister President Cole, if I may use a phrase I learned from her, is an inspiration on so many levels, it's hard to know where to begin. She enrolled at Fisk University at the age of 15 and went on to complete her undergraduate degree in sociology at Oberlin College. She earned a master's and a PhD in anthropology with a specialization in African studies at Northwestern. From there, she went on to hold faculty positions at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Hunter College and Emory University. And she now holds more than 60 honorary degrees. She has achieved an almost unbelievably impressive list of firsts. Dr. Cole is the co-founder of one of the first Black Studies programs in the United States at Washington State University, the first Black female president of Spelman College. She is the only person to serve as president of both historically Black colleges for women in the United States, since she also served as president of Bennett College. She's the first African-American to serve as the chair of the board of the United Way of America, and she's the first woman appointed to the board of Coca-Cola Enterprises. Through these and other leadership roles, she has touched the lives of literally millions. As president of Spelman, Dr. Cole led the college's most successful capital campaign to date, increased enrollments, and improved the school's ranking. In, in 1992, it was named the number one regional liberal arts college in the South by US News and World Report. As president of Bennett College, she led a second successful capital campaign and founded an art gallery on campus. This was a sign of things to come. Instead of retiring, Dr. Cole began a second or perhaps third career of sorts, serving as the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. From there, she's taken on a series of senior consulting positions, most recently at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Among her many awards is the 2013 Alston Jones International Civil and Human Rights Award, the highest citation given by the International Civil Rights Center and Museum. 
She speaks to us now a little more than a year after what many have described as one of America's most serious moments of reckoning with racism and inequality. As we at ACLS continue our journey of learning and action against racism, along with many others in our audience, I'm sure, we are especially happy to honor someone who has dedicated so much to thinking and teaching about race, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Her most recent book published just in February of this year, Racism in American Public Life, is a call for individuals and organizations to re-examine their roles in structural biases that persist in much of our society. It's one of two volumes published as the Malcolm Lester Phi Beta Kappa Lectures on Liberal Arts and Public Life. Dr. Cole wonderfully conveys her distinctive contribution as a leader in her own words in this book. I brought to my new professional involvement in the world of art museums, the same concerns about diversity that I constantly posed about the world of higher education, she wrote. Why is it that the majority of museums in the US and around the world do not use the visual arts to tell the stories of all people why is it that only 9% of the visitors to art museums in the US are people of color? Why is it that 46% of museum boards in the US are all white? Why is it that despite the increasing numbers of women holding the top leadership role of director at US museums, the larger a museum's budget, the less chance there is that the director is a woman? And why is it that only 12% of the individuals in leadership positions in museums are people of color? These are hard truths and difficult conversations. Yet, Dr. Cole argues, we must find a way to recognize these truths and engage in these conversations. To do so, we need to seek for and acknowledge documented facts and examine them in historical context. Only this will illuminate the system level problems, including structural racism that plague society. And that we, and she says this with confidence and optimism, have the ability to solve. In Racism and American Public Life, as in her earlier work and scholarship, Dr. Cole advocates powerfully for humanistic understanding as key to reshaping conversations and beliefs about race and racism and many other things. She sees colleges and universities and museums as the proper sites to understand, explain, and challenge racism and other wicked problems of our age. Reading and talking across the disciplines, literature, philosophy, history, the arts, anthropology. These are the necessary tools for building a more just society. Few people on this planet know the world of colleges and museums better. And few can parallel Dr. Cole's experience in organizing for change. She currently serves as the national chair and seventh president of the National Council of Negro Women, an advocacy organization with more than 2 million members. Last month, the Baltimore Museum of Art appointed her special counsel on strategic initiatives. She will work with the museum's board and the leadership team as they implement their strategic plan. And just a few weeks ago, she received a shout out at the Oscars as an expression of thanks for the consulting work she did for this year's best animated feature, Soul. I mentioned Dr. Cole's many firsts, and we're going to hear about her life of scholarship today. I want to close by emphasizing one aspect of her achievements as a scholar and as a leader that's impossible to capture in any CV or resume. Maya Brooks, a young curator of a new exhibit at the North Carolina Museum of Art, put it perfectly. When I was growing up, she said, there was only one black woman curator that I could look to, Ms. Janetta B. Cole at the Smithsonian. Now there are so many of us, and it's so nice to see us in these spaces and say, hey, I can do this work. Dr. Cole, on behalf of all of us at the American Council of Learned Societies and the 78 societies we represent, let me express our gratitude for your world-changing achievements. And let me thank you for speaking to us today. I want to thank Sister President Joy Connolly and the American Council of Learned Societies for the privilege of offering this Haskin Prize Lecture. I also want to thank the Amelia Island Museum of History for providing this site for me to present my lecture. And I'm certainly grateful to my husband, James Dayton, other family members, friends, colleagues who are present or 
virtually present for this event. I turn now to describe the major threads in my life of learning, threads that I continue to weave into the fabric of my work. Like many children, when I was growing up, I asked many questions. Why is the sky blue? Would I throw my ball up into the air? What makes it come down? Where do babies come from? If I can't say bad words, why do we even have them? And why can't I have more chocolate ice cream? Thankfully, even when my parents did not have an easy answer for my questions, they never discouraged my curiosity. As a black child growing up in Jacksonville, Florida, during the days of legal segregation, I posed countless questions. Questions about a system that was so profoundly unjust. At an early age, I, like the children all over the world, soon discovered the advantages and disadvantages associated with my skin color. Growing up, I noticed how the lessons for white children taught them what privileges they automatically possessed simply because they were white. <clears throat> And through what Richard Wright once referred to as the ethics of living Jim Crow, black children had to be taught what privileges they automatically did not possess simply because they were black. None of this felt fair to me. Years later, after I no longer resided in Jacksonville, my mother recalled some of the questions posed as a young girl. While my parents never tried to shield me from the truth, my mother felt compelled to respond to my questions in terms that my young mind could understand. Additionally, they insisted that I abide by laws that were grossly unjust. Otherwise, I risked compromising my safety. Today, black parents still feel compelled to have what we often call the talk. They have the talk with their children in the hopes that it will protect them from being verbally abused, physically harmed, and even killed by police officers who abuse their authority. My mother, in a conversation, shared how, as a child, I struggled to make sense out of why there were whites-only signs above certain water fountains and colored signs over others. Is it because, I asked, there are two kinds of water? My mother also recalled my sense of displeasure over a practice that I argued was not fair. Namely, when white children received new school books, they sent their old ones to colored children's schools like the ones I attended. My mother could not remember exactly how old I was when I discovered that different cemeteries existed for white people and black people. But she did recall that I searched for a reason. I asked, does this mean there are separate heavens for white and black people? A lesson I distinctly remember receiving from my parents also from my grandparents, yes, my great-grandparents, from my teachers, Girl Scout leaders, Sunday school teachers, and community leaders. 
is this. Segregation is wrong. Racism is wrong. And when you are old enough, you have a responsibility to work against all of this. I have attempted to do so throughout my life. As a young person, I confronted challenges that were associated with both my race and my gender. But I did not grow up poor. In fact, I grew up as the great granddaughter of Abraham Lincoln Lewis, Florida's first black millionaire. Born in 1865 to parents who had been enslaved, my great grandfather only obtained an elementary school education. But his exceptional drive and business acumen led him to join with six other African-American men to found the Afro-American Life Insurance Company in 1901. In 1935, my great-grandfather took the lead in using funds from the Pension Bureau of the Afro-American Life Insurance Company to purchase 200 acres of beachfront land in Nassau County along the Atlantic Ocean. During that time, Black people were legally prohibited from going to beaches reserved for white people. Nevertheless, with my great grandfather's land purchase, the employees of the Afro-American Life Insurance Company, their families and other Black citizens could enjoy, as he said, recreation and relaxation without humiliation on American beach. My parents often reminded me, my older sister, Marvin Oshun Betch, my younger brother, John Thomas Betch Jr., and me, that it was our great grandfather who was a millionaire, not us. Still, being the great granddaughter of A.L. Lewis, as he was known, mitigated some of the pain and stress that comes with being black in America. My siblings and I were often driven places, and thus we avoided being forced to sit in the back of a bus. Our family regularly enjoyed vacations to northern cities where even though systemic racism was in full force, the Jim Crow laws of Southern states were not visibly present. While class could never trump race, it did make it possible for my sister, my brother and me to grow up in a household where reproductions of great art, including the works of renowned black artists were on the walls of our home. Shelves in our living room were filled with classic literature, including the works of great American authors. My great grandfather benefited from a close friendship and relationship with the legendary educator, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. Born in 1875, in a small log cabin near Mayersville, South Carolina. She was born to parents who had been enslaved. She was the 15th of 17 children. When Dr. Bethune was five years old, she started working in the fields with her family. However, she was the only one in her family who insisted on attending school. After walking five miles to and five miles from a one-room schoolhouse each day, she shared what she had learned with her parents and siblings. Dr. Bethune once said this, the whole world opened to me 
when I learned to read. She dreamed of opening a school and after graduating from Scotia Seminary for Girls in 1893, she founded the Daytona Normal and Industrial Seminary for Girls. The year was 1893. In 1904, Dr. Bethune became Bethune Cookman College's president. And she co-founded the United Negro College Fund. And in 1935, she founded the National Council of Negro Women, known as NCNW. It is an organization that counts 2 million women of African descent among its membership. NCNW's mission is to lead, advocate for, and empower women of African descent, their families and communities. I'm honored to serve as the seventh president and chair of the NCNW board. Dr. Bethune, recruited by great grandfather to serve on the board of Bethune Cookman College, where she was a president and he recruited her to serve on the board of Edward Borders College, where he was an active board member. Because of their friendship, my sister and I had the privilege of being mentored by Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. I had two similar experiences during the early days of my education. Those experiences set me on a lifelong journey of learning and teaching. As an African proverb says, she who learns must teach and she who teaches must learn. My parents believed in the power of education to prepare an individual to understand the world and to understand themselves and to play a role in making the world more just and peaceful. Acting on that belief, my parents saw no reason why I should wait until I was six years old to begin elementary school. And so when I was five, I went to College Park Elementary School, one of Jacksonville's schools for colored children. I was a shy youngster and I looked forward to my first day in school with a mixture of excitement and trepidation. I took comfort though in entering Miss Bernie's Vance's first grade classroom because I was holding the hand of B.B. Ross Coker, my best childhood friend with whom I continue to have a close sisterly friendship and a shared passion for the uniquely human activity that we call education. As the school day began, my classmates and I sat stoically in our seats until our teacher entered the classroom. Upon her entrance, we all stood in unison as an expression of respect. Standing in front of our first grade classroom, Miss Vance greeted us with, good morning, boys and girls. Welcome to the first grade. Please take your seats. Her excitement signaled to us that it was the first day of what would be a defining experience in our young lives. Miss Vance then said, beginning on this row, on this side of the classroom, I want each of you to stand up and introduce yourselves. I was so grateful that I was seated on the last row and I hope that by the time it was my turn to introduce myself, I would have gained enough courage to do what Ms. Vance had asked us to do. When it was my turn to introduce myself, I reluctantly stood 
looking down at the floor where I hoped I would find some courage. I said, my name is Johnetta Betch. Miss Vance quickly glided across the classroom floor to where I stood and directly in front of me, she said, John Netta, stand up straight, look directly at me and do not ever again mumble your name. Remember, in this classroom, we will be educating future leaders. In those days of legal segregation, when black children attended colored schools and were taught by black teachers only, Miss Vance was not an exception. Despite the assumption that black schools were inferior places of learning, many of our teachers took exceptional pride in their teaching and always promoted educational excellence. Indeed, it was not rare for women and men who grew up in the Jim Crow days to attribute much of their success to teachers like Miss Bunny Vance. When we were teenagers, our parents decided to send my sister and me to an all girls private school sponsored by the Methodist Episcopal Church. The girls who attended the school ranged in age from 13 to 18. All of the students were African-American. The name of the school did not include the word colored. Instead, it was simply named Boylan Haven School for Girls. Now, let me tell you, those of us who were students, we girls often called our school Boy less haven. Unlike the public schools, our teachers at Boylan Haven were black and white women, with the exception of our civics teacher, Mr. Andrews, who was an African American man. Our Latin teacher, Miss Morse, was a short white woman who always conditioned her tightly permed hair with too much blue rinse, or so we girls thought while giggling to ourselves. Like Miss Vance, Miss Morse taught me a lesson that has served me well in life. Since Miss Vance had made it clear that I was to be a leader, I decided to take her advice. And I decided to act as a leader of the girls in Miss Morse's Latin class. I gathered all of the girls in our Latin class and laid out a plan for how we would begin our next class. Just as Miss Morse arrived into the classroom, I would give a signal. And when I gave the signal, we were to say, trying as best we could not to move our lips. Latin, Latin, dead as can be. First it killed the Romans, now it's killing me. Miss Morse simply ignored us. The next day, when we repeated our prank, Miss Morse firmly advised, you girls must stop saying that. But we didn't. The next day when we pulled our prank, Miss Morris said this, you girls are not in this classroom to do what you were claiming, to learn a language from dead people. You are African-American girls who are to learn that because you are black girls, you can learn anything. After I completed the ninth grade at Boylis or Boylan Haven for girls, I convinced my parents to let me leave Boylan Haven and join some of my friends who attended the all black 
Stanton High School, where I then spent my 10th and 11th grades. Today, it is known as Stanton College Preparatory School. It is number 77 in the national rankings. From an early age, I was told that I would go to college. Both of my parents had graduated from historically black colleges. My mother, Mary Frances Lewis Betch, was a graduate of Ohio's Wilberforce College, now a university. My father, John Thomas Betch Sr., was a graduate of Knoxville College in Knoxville, Tennessee. But before my mother entered the world of business as the treasurer of the family's business, Afro-American Life Insurance Company, she served as a professor of English and the registrar at Edward Waters College, a historically black college in our hometown. However, my parents decided that I should leave Stanton and enter an early entrance program at Fisk University. I did not want to leave Stanton. My friends were there. Indeed, it occurred to me that I could purposefully fail the exam that determined whether I would be selected to attend Fisk University as a 15-year-old student. Ah, uh, but once the test was in front of me, I decided against that course of action. In September 1953, I was one among a group of black children who entered Fisk University in an early entrance program. At Fisk, administrators and teachers carefully monitored our social life, but we were fully exposed to the intellectual rigor. We were exposed to art and music for which Fisk is known. We were in awe of the list of notable Fisk alumni that included Ida B. Wells, W.E.B. Du Bois, John Hope Franklin, James Weldon Johnson, and Constance Baker Motley. How impressed we were to attend classes taught by Robert Hayden, a U.S. poet laureate, ethnomusicologist John W. Work III, and Harlem Renaissance painter, Aaron Douglas. Some years later, I would take pride in knowing that the great civil rights activist, Diane Nash and the late John Lewis were Fisk alumni. Of course, we were inspired by the famous Fisk Jubilee singers. When they were not on tour, I joined with other students in attending their university concerts. Each time, each and every time that I traveled to the Fisk University Library from some part of the campus, I would glance excitedly at the murals that Aaron Douglas had been commissioned to paint in 1931 for the new campus library. And I would settle into my academic work in a library where the head librarian was none other, none other than the distinguished poet and novelist, Aaron Bonta. When I entered Fisk, I already possessed familiarity with some of the great European American and African American artists. My mother, had not formally studied art history, nor was she a studio artist. Ah, oh, but my mother possessed what museum professionals call the eye. She recognized a great work of art when she saw one, and she adorned our home with spectacular reproductions of art. Subsequently at Fisk, in addition to several other recognizable pieces, I was thrilled to see original works of art in the Fisk University galleries 
that included the Carl Van Vechten Gallery, the Aaron Douglas Gallery, and the Aaron Douglas murals. In 1949, Georgia O'Keeffe donated 101 works of art to Fisk University, a collection that included African masks and modernist paintings. The collection, which is now shared by Fisk University and Crystal Bridges Museum, was a part of the Carl Van Vechten's enormous collection. In that collection are works by Cezanne, Renoir, Picasso, Diego Rivera, as well as some works by American artists, including Georgia O'Keeffe. It is important to note that during the late 1800s and early 1900s, Fisk University and other historically black colleges and universities were the only places where African-Americans could visit museums. After that, excuse me, please, until separate but equal was outlawed in 1954, black people could visit museums only on the colored only visiting day. I had only been attending FIS for about four months when I received the devastating news that my father had passed unexpectedly. Though my heart longed for the comfort of home and family in Jacksonville, my mother and sister encouraged me to finish the academic year at Fisk before applying to Oberlin College. Because my sister was at Oberlin College where she double majored in piano and voice at the Oberlin Conservatory. I followed my family's advice and continued my life of learning at Oberlin. Just as it was important to me that Fisk University was a citadel of black intellectual and artistic excellence. It mattered to me that in 1835, Oberlin was the first college in the United States to admit black students. And in 1841, Oberlin was the first college in the United States to grant bachelor's degrees to women. I thrived on the intellectual life at Oberlin. I attended concerts of conservatory faculty and students. And through frequent visits to Oberlin's Allen Memorial Art Museum, I deepened my knowledge and love of the visual arts. Oberlin's long history of activism resonated with me. And I took special interest in the important role that Oberlin had played in helping enslaved families escape along the Underground Railroad. At Oberlin, just as at Fisk, I saw that a liberal arts education was designed to help students, yes, understand the world, and in that process, to better understand themselves and contribute to making the world a far better place. My plans to pursue a pre-med course of study at Oberlin quickly ended on the first day of Professor George Eaton Simpson's Introduction to Cultural Anthropology. At the conclusion of Professor Simpson's lively and informative lecture on African retentions in New World cultures, I retired my long-standing intention to become a pediatrician, and I vowed to become an anthropologist. Because Oberlin did not offer a major in anthropology at that time, I majored in sociology. Truth is, I majored in Professor Simpson because he agreed that I could pursue a number 
of independent study courses in anthropology under his tutelage. After I discovered anthropology, I was so enamored with the discipline that I wanted to begin graduate studies in that field immediately after I graduated from Oberlin. Professor Simpson urged me to apply to Northwestern University where I could pursue a graduate degree in anthropology with an emphasis on African studies. And he assured me I would be able to study with the renowned Professor Melville J. Herskovitz. Indeed, Professor Simpson's work on Nigerian and Caribbean religions have been strongly influenced by the work of Professor Herskovitz. When I arrived at Northwestern, I was aware that many graduate programs across the country, including at Northwestern, were being criticized as uninviting places for women and for people of color. Northwestern's anthropology department continued the historical particularism and cultural relativism associated with Franz Boas, the father of American anthropology. Additionally, Professor Herskovitz, who was a student of Franz Boas, was committed to training women and people of color, just as Boas had trained Hortense Powdermaker, Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict, and yes, my shero, Zora Neale Hurston. As a student in Northwestern's anthropology department and the African studies program, I participated in courses with a stellar faculty. But it must be noted that among my professors, Professor Carter was the only woman and Professor Xu, who was born in China, was the only person of color. Unfortunately, even now, there are still racial and gender disparities in all academic disciplines, including anthropology. We have just got to work to overcome these racial and gender disparities. Professor Herskovitz was short in statue with a sizable ego. That is why, given my five feet seven inches of height, I located a seat as quickly as possible when I had a meeting with Professor Herskovitz in his office. He did agree to chair my master's thesis committee. However, when I informed him that I wanted to conduct field work in an African-American church on Chicago's South Side, I had to convince him to give me permission to do what was unusual for anthropologists at that time, namely to do what is called native anthropology, which meant that I, an African-American would conduct a study in an African-American community. After obtaining my MA in anthropology at Northwestern, I went to Tours, France, where I lived with a family that assisted me in learning enough French to pass one of the language requirements, a requirement to get a PhD in anthropology. Now I'm gonna confess that I passed the second language requirement, which involved translating a passage in German. I did it simply because the passage I was given was the very passion, excuse me, passage that the day before in a class, we had read it, a passage from Johann Jacob Bachofen's classic 1861 book that is titled Das Muderreich. 
You see, sometimes you don't have to know something if luck is on your side. After completing my master's degree in anthropology in 1959, under the direction, I had done that, of Professor Herskovitz, I began then to study with Professor Paul J. Bohanna. The two scholars worked under two competing schools of thought. Professor Herskovitz was a cultural anthropologist. Professor Bohannon was a social anthropologist. I recall a day when a group of students and I were in the graduate students' lounge and we heard Professors Herskovitz and Bohannon in a heated exchange. Professor Herskovitz said, Jim, the problem with you is that you have no sense of history. Jim Bohannon responded, the problem with you, Mel, is that you have no sense of society. Overhearing the debate from the student lounge where we were, one of my fellow graduate students quipped softly enough not to be heard by our professors. What are you gonna do if there's a plague upon both of your houses? When it was time for me to pursue field work, I joined with my late husband, Robert Cole and Robert Armstrong, both of whom were PhD candidates in economics at Northwestern I joined them in carrying out research in Liberia. Each of us had permission to draw on our research for the project in connection with our doctoral dissertations. The experience of living in Liberia <coughs> impacted me professionally and personally. As the anthropologist Clyde Cluckhorn once said, it will not be a fish that discovers water. This is a clever way of saying that because a fish is always in water, it will hardly make any discoveries about water. In other words, living outside of one's own country, as I did for two years in Liberia, can trigger discoveries about aspects of culture in one's own country in my case, America. I wish every American student could have an opportunity to live for some amount of time in a different culture. I've often thought of the value that would come from having black and white Americans live for some period of time in each other's culture. Or suppose cis women and cis men spent time in circumstances that are typically experienced by the other person's gender. The point is this, there is much that can be learned by walking in someone else's shoes. After living in Liberia for two years, I returned to the United States. The year was 1964. And my late husband and I both found teaching positions in our respective disciplines of both economics and anthropology. We found teaching positions at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. The 60s were a time of heightened political and racial tensions in the United States. We were in the midst of the Vietnam War and there were ongoing sit-ins, freedom rides, and protests that called for an end to racial segregation. And back during the 60s, feminists also demanded equal job opportunities and an end to sexist discrimination. At Washington State, just as on campuses across the United States, Black students who attended predominantly white institutions engaged in demonstrations. In some cases, they took over buildings as they demanded more black students and black faculty on their campuses, as they called for a change in the curriculum to include the history 
and the culture of black people. During my years at Washington State, I learned to look at the university through the lived experiences of my students. I joined with them in demonstrating against the war in Vietnam. I went to jail with them in connection with our demands for more black students, black faculty, and our demand for black studies. As my colleagues and I sought to launch a black studies program, we had to articulate the case, the case for an interdisciplinary study of the black experience. We also had to explain that the absence of scholarship about black people was not some incidental omission in the curriculum. Among the reasons that black history and culture were not taught was a legacy from the days when white scholars argued that black people did not have a history or a culture. Today, many years after the first black studies department was founded at San Francisco State College in 1968, there are colleges and universities that refuse to consider this interdisciplinary field. In 1970, I was asked to join the anthropology department and the newly formed W.E.B. Du Bois Department of African American Studies at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. I was also asked to affiliate with the newly formed Women Studies Program. During the years that I was at the University of Massachusetts, and there were 13 years that I was there, I also taught at each of the colleges in what was called the Five College Consortium. I taught at Amherst, Hampshire, Mount Holyoke, and Smith Colleges. The Department of Afro-American Studies at the University of Massachusetts was named after the great intellectual and activist, W.E.B. Du Bois. He was the first scholar to pioneer the study of people of African descent in the United States and throughout the world. The department was born out of student and faculty activism that involved, in fact, a takeover of Mills Hall, a student dormitory that was later named New Africa House. The department of Afro-American studies was deeply enriched by the presence of well-known scholars. And I will name just a few. Michael Thelwell, Nelson Stevens, Playfell Benjamin, Julius Lester, John Bracey, Esther Terry, Max Roach, Archie Shep, Chet Davis, Ernie Allen, Shirley Graham Du Bois, and Chinua Achebe. When we gathered for faculty me meetings, I continued to pose this question. Why are there so few women in this department? And when I interacted with colleagues in the Women's Studies program, I continued to ask, why aren't there more black people and other people of color in this program? Over the course of the years that I was at the University of Massachusetts as a faculty member and as associate provost of undergraduate education, I initiated educational programs for incarcerated women in the Framingham Medium Correctional Institution for Women. And I also initiated educational programs in Walpole, the maximum security institution for men that was renamed Cedar Junction. The university students who participated in this program with me often commented that they learned more about their country and themselves from this experience than in many of their courses on campus. In the days when I taught in Massachusetts prisons, 
black and brown people were disproportionately incarcerated. Not much has changed in that regard. The Color of Justice report, which is published by the Sentencing Project Research and Advocacy for Reform, indicates that today, African Americans are incarcerated in state prisons across the United States at five times the rate of white people. In five states, African Americans are incarcerated at least 10 times the rate of white people. Latinx people are imprisoned at a rate of 4.1 times the rate of white people. The same report notes that prison populations are beginning, as one would say, to stabilize and even decline slightly. The report suggests that this decline is due to some strategic reform in the criminal justice system, but also due to diminishing crime rates since the mid 1990s. However, we will never see significant declines in prison populations if we do not address ongoing racial and ethnic disparities. When people are incarcerated, there are collateral consequences that continue to impact them long after they have served their time. I mean, such as restricted employment, housing instability, family disruption, stigma, and disenfranchisement. Why are there such disparities? Three obvious reasons are unfair policies and procedures, including harsh sentencing for drug use, the pervasiveness of implicit racial biases, and structural disadvantages such as poverty. So what is to be done? Among the proposals that make sense to me are regular training on implicit bias for law enforcement officials and the cessation of long-term incarceration for what are in fact minor offenses. We must also create effective educational programs so that individuals leave prisons with certain basic life skills that will improve their life chances and reduce recidivism. Additionally, we will go a long way in reducing the stigma of incarceration when the rights of women and men who have served their time have the right to vote. With the experiences of teaching in diverse settings under my belt, in 1983, I accepted Hunter College President Donna Shalala's invitation to serve as the first Russell Sage professor in the social sciences. It was yet another opportunity to teach and to learn in an academic institution. My appointment also involved my serving as the director of the Latin American Studies Program at the City University of New York's Graduate Center. That position allowed me to draw on my knowledge of and experiences in Cuba, Haiti, the Virgin Islands, the Dominican Republic, and other countries in the Caribbean where I had carried out anthropological research. But what taught me the most was the result of a collegial and sisterly relationship with Audrey Lord. I arrived at Hunter College under the assumption that my years of teaching and research in anthropology, black studies and women's studies had relieved me of any homophobic beliefs. However, it was Audre Lorde, a professor at Hunter, as well as the Port Laureate of the state of New York, 
who helped me to see, name, and confront my homophobia. The process that I engaged in with Audre Lorde has lessons for anyone who seeks to eliminate their biases and to stop acting in ways that perpetrate systemic racism, systemic sexism, heterosexism, and all other systems of inequality. First and importantly, Audre Lorde challenged me to cease seeing her in terms of only one of her identities. Indeed, she had a lighthearted but profoundly effective way of making this point. While introducing herself before a presentation, she would proclaim in a deep and commanding voice, I am Audre Lorde, a black woman, mother, lesbian, professor, poet, warrior. I do not wake up at eight o'clock in the morning as a woman. And at nine, I become a black person, but for only an hour, because when the clock strikes 10 a.m., I become a lesbian. And so hour after hour, I have only one identity. Then with a rather curious and probing look, she posed the question, am I not each and all of these identities? Audre Lorde also helped me to fully own how an individual may be victimized on the basis of one of their identities and in turn victimize another based on a different identity. For example, an individual who identifies primarily as an African-American can be victimized on the basis of race. At the same time, that person can victimize someone else because of their sexual identity. It is not uncommon for white women to experience systemic sexism, but to simultaneously participate in acts that fuel systemic racism. Yet another example is when an individual is the object of anti-Semitism and a perpetrator of Islamophobia. After my relationship with Audre Lorde had grown, I asked her to give her papers to the Spelman College Archives, and she did. With the exception of a small number of papers that she had promised to the Lesbian Archives in New York, all of Audre Lorde's papers and memorabilia are housed at Spelman College Archives. To serve as the president of Spelman College, one of the only two historically black colleges for women was not on my wish list. I was fully engaged at Hunter. I was engaged with and enjoyed being a professor. However, I was instructed to apply for the position and I was instructed to do so by my mentors. Spelman alumna, Marion Wright Edelman, who at that time was the president of the Children's Defense Fund and the chair of the board at Spelman College, and Donna Shalala, president emerita of the University of Wisconsin, and at that time, the president of Hunter College. I did as my mentors instructed me to do. Serving as the president of Spelman from 1987 to 1997 was clearly one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. When the board selected me as the seventh president of Spelman College, it was an historic, or perhaps I should say, her historic appointment because I was the first black woman to serve as the president of Spelman College 
in the college's 107 years as an academic institution. Over the course of the 10 years that I was privileged to serve as Spelman's president, I worked along with faculty, alumni, staff, administrators, and a number of donors and supporters to help Spelman College soar to the point that she was named by US News and World Report as the number one liberal arts college in the South. Fundraising reached a new level with the completion of a capital campaign. Spelman continued its long-term engagement with the other four institutions that comprised the Atlanta University Center. And the college continued its long history of engagement in community service and social justice. I held monthly office hours for Spelman students. An exchange with one student captures what an education meant to the African-American women who came to Spelman College. After welcoming this particular student into my office, I shared with her that I had reviewed her application and I was profoundly impressed, impressed by her scholarship and her community service. Based on her record, I said, you know, my sister, you could have chosen to attend any of the Ivy League schools in our country. Why did you choose Spelman? She quickly responded by saying this, Sister President, I'm going to be an astrophysicist and I did not want to go to a college where a professor might look at me and say, Honey, are you sure you can do physics? While at Spelman, it was important that I remain in the classroom so that I would have first-hand knowledge of the academic life of our students, and also so that I could remain intellectually engaged. And so I co-taught a course in women's studies with Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal, a stellar scholar and professor in women's studies and the director of the Women's Research and Resource Center at Spelman. I also taught an introductory course in anthropology. I'm proud to say that three outstanding African-American women professors, Dr. Rashade Dangabon, Dr. Marla Frederick and Dr. Kamala Hayward Rotimi, all three were introduced to the field of anthropology in the course they took with me at Spelman College. And during the time that my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Catherine Bateson, was a visiting professor at Spelman, we co taught an anthropology course. Well, in 1997, I retired from Spelman, but I was not done, obviously, with being a teacher scholar. I accepted an invitation from President William Chase to serve as presidential scholar in anthropology, African-American studies, and women's studies at Emory University. This appointment had a special meaning for me because I had struggled over the course of my academic life to find a single discipline that I felt would indeed appropriately and continuously explore so much that I felt needed exploring. After retiring once again, it was Dr. Maya Angelou and at the time she was on the board of trustees of Bennett College, it was Dr. Angelo who urged me to come out of retirement to serve as the president of the only other historically back college for women in the United States. With help from Bennett's extended family, we raised a sufficient amount of money to remove the college from probation for fiscal 
insecurity. With the help of Bennett faculty, staff, alumni, students, and friends, we accomplished a great deal during my five years at the college. I want to note in particular the assistance of Bennett College Professor of Art, Dr. Alma Adams, who is currently in the United States House of Representatives. I acknowledge Professor Alma Adams' assistance in raising funds that allowed us to open for the first time a fine art gallery at Bennett College. And with the assistance of many in the Bennett College family and beyond, we launched a women's studies program. There's a long tradition of student activism at Bennett College. While the Greensboro Four are acknowledged for their role in igniting the sit-in movement, large numbers of Bennett College women participated in those sit-ins. Indeed, Bennett College Professor Emerita, Dr. Linda Brown, has said, based on her research and lived experience, Bennett women were a part of the initial strategizing of that sit-in movement. In 2004, the John Etta B. Cole Global Diversity and Inclusion Institute was founded at Bennett College. The Institute was a precursor of efforts today to address systemic inequality in corporations, educational institutions, cultural institutions, such as museums. I also want to note that during my years at Bennett, we reinforced the tradition of civic participation by students. I would often lead the call and response. I would say, Bennett bells, and students would respond, our voting bells. Today, like many small liberal arts colleges that are challenged fiscally, Bennett seeks to find a new model for how the college can sustain itself financially and continue her long tradition of educating Black women. In 2007, I retired once again, this time from Bennett College. However, once again, my retirement did not last long because I could not resist the privilege of serving as a director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. I brought to that position a passion for the visual arts, including African art, and a willingness to be in the role of a student as curators, conservators, and others at the museum played the role of the teacher. In the eight years that I was at the National Museum of African Art, there were many moments when my colleagues felt that we had successfully collaborated. We had learned from each other and we had achieved a bold outcome. For example, the National Museum of African Art sent to the Nigerian Museum in Benin the first exhibition that the Smithsonian had ever sent to the African continent. The exhibition is centered on the photography of Chief Solomon Alonge, who served as the official photographer for the Oba of Benin. In 2017, I retired for a third time as I left the Smithsonian with the title of Director Emerita. I joined Cook Ross as a principal consultant. What did I do? Well, I was charged with assisting corporations, educational institutions, museums, and other nonprofit organizations to do what is required to transform their organizations into places with far greater diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. For two years, 
I served as a senior consulting fellow at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Doing so afforded me an exceptional opportunity to work on issues that I had been engaged in over many, many years. I was particularly interested in being involved with the Foundation's demographic survey of museums that documented the need for far more focused attention to diversifying museums. Diversifying museums in their workplaces, exhibitions, and audiences. That work kept me in collaboration with the Association of Museum Directors and the American Alliance of Museums. In the process of preparing this lecture, I have truly enjoyed reflecting on my life of learning. And I've given much thought to how my academic work and my activism coexist. Listen to these words of Marion Wright Edelman. She, she said, education is for improving the lives of others and for leaving your community and world better than you found it. Most of all, preparing this lecture confirmed that I really am a perpetual learner. I enjoy and learn when I'm teaching, whether it takes place in a classroom or when I am sharing ideas during a conversation with a colleague or perhaps I'm speaking in a formal context or in an exchange of ideas with my mentees, my friends, members of my family. As I conclude this lecture, I leave you with this African proverb. Not to know is bad, not to want to know is worse. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Cole, for that inspiring lecture. I'm so pleased to hear it. I'm moved. I'm excited. You ended by saying, uh, by citing uh, Dr. Edelman, uh, leave the world better than you, you found it. I can't think of a person who uh, does that and exemplifies this spirit more than you. Um, thank you so much for that. I will also note, uh, make one more note that um, as a scholar of Roman culture myself, I'm especially pleased to hear of the role that learning Latin played in your very early career. Uh, but uh, throughout uh, every step of the way, uh, you have blazed paths and created a model for us now and for generations to come. Thank you so much. And thank you to our audience for joining us uh, for this lecture. We're honored to have Dr. Janetta Betch Cole as our speaker. We are happy to have you, our global audience. We wish you happiness and health. Thank you.